I'd like to uh, extend my warm welcome to everybody here. It's great to see everybody and to meet some new people. Uh, my name is Mark Thornton. I'm going to be the moderator of the authors panel this year. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Patrick Newman, a multi-time summer fellow. And he's going to tell us a little bit about what he's found in the Rothbard archives. Well, uh, thank you everyone for being here. It's an honor to uh, speak at the Supporters Summit. It's an honor to uh, have the first uh, talk, at least about what I've been doing in the Rothbard archives. So as the author's panel, uh, I'm going to be talking about two books that I'm not actually the author of, but I've edited. And they're both two books of Murray Rothbard's uh, that have been published uh, after his death on uh, books that he never finished or one book that he actually completely finished. So the first book I'll be talking about briefly is Rothbard's The Progressive Era, uh, which uh, came out with the Mises Institute in the fall of 2017. And it's a, it was an unpublished and unfinished book on the progressive era combined with his later essays. So it has a complete, uh, you know, sort of his, over, you know, his arch, overarching analysis of the progressive era. And uh, you can buy that downstairs now. And then the second book I'll be talking about, which is something I'm currently working on, uh, is Rothbard's fifth volume of Conceived in Liberty. Uh, if you'd like, uh, you can buy the complete four-volume book, this very fat book that, you know, can almost be used as a weapon, uh, you know, to sort of bludgeon someone. It's, it's, it's over, you know, it's the thousands of pages. Um, believe it or not, there's actually another 300 pages uh, to go on that. Uh, so I'll be talking about that uh, in a second. So, it's, you know, the, the, the man keeps on writing. He, you know, he has an enormous amount of publications well after his death. And I think that really just highlights his enormous output in his, uh, his intellect and all of his, his, his various research interests. So uh, the first book, uh, as uh, Dr. Thornton mentioned, I've a, I was a Mises Fellow multiple years. And some of the things that I've worked on while I was a Mises Fellow was in the Rothbard archives. Uh, which I can really only, uh, I, I highly encourage you to visit the archives upstairs. In fact, you can actually see some of Rothbard's handwritten pages for the fifth volume of Conceived in Liberty, which I'll be talking about. Uh, really, the only way I can describe the Rothbard archives, at least working in the archives, is, is being a kid in a candy store, where you, you wake up and you say, I'm going to the Rothbard archives, I'm reading Rothbard's letters, I'm reading his manuscripts, I'm reading stuff that, you know, he's, he's corresponding with people, or, you know, he might have been the only person to see, and that's all I'm going to do today, and, well, there's frankly nothing else I'd rather do today. Uh, so, you know, you have to drag me away when it's lunch, or when, you know, uh, Barbara uh, leaves the, the archives, etc. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely thrilling to be there and to work there. So the Progressive Era, uh, we had some Rothbard in the 1970s, was commissioned to write a book, a full-length book on the Progressive Era, which he was really working on in the late 1970s. And in this book, he sort of, if anyone's ever listened to his lectures, uh, The American Economy, The End of Laissez-Faire, uh, from the 1870s to World War II, you can find it online. Uh, he really basically just goes through, it's his analysis of that period in a book. So he starts from the railroad interventions, of uh, the, you know, the 1860s to the Interstate Commerce Commission, to the merger movement, uh, up to the end of the, the fall of the laissez-faire Grover Cleveland Democrats in 1896, and through the Theodore Roosevelt administration. And he never finished the book, but he did sort of informally finish it by writing uh, essays on material he wanted to cover, such as World War I, the Federal Reserve, the welfare state, etc. So this book, uh, the completed book, you know, has his published, you know, his, his, the, the manuscript, nine chapters, as well as six later essays, so sort of 15 chapters in total, uh, along with an editor's introduction. Um, and it sort of goes through his over, uh, you know, his overarching analysis of the progressive era. So if you, you know, want to get an understanding of, okay, how the government sort of from a minimal, relatively minimal government in the 19th century, you know, moved to the heavily interventionist government of today, highly recommend you read the book. And the traditional analysis of the progressive era is that, well, it's a period of these sort of enlightened, you know, reformers, the Paul Krugmans, the Elizabeth Warrens of the day, <laughs> you know, the public interest that had the, that the right ideas in mind. And then there were the just, you know, it was just the entrenched businesses, the, the selfish interest, they fought them. You know, Rothbard's analysis, it's really the regressive era. It's a return of sort of the mercantilism of before, where actually it was really more of special interests bureaucracies looking to enhance their own power, large businesses trying to shackle their smaller competitors, et cetera. 
So I would tell you more about it, but if I tell you too much, then no one's going to buy the book. So I have to at least leave a little bit, uh, leave a little bit hanging. Now, uh, the project I'm currently working on is, as I mentioned, the fifth volume of Conceived in Liberty. So Rothbard wrote four volumes on colonial America from basically the, the founding of, you know, Jamestown, the you know, early 1600s, 1607, all the way to the end of the American Revolution. He sort of ends in 1784. He had an unpublished fifth volume that dealt with the Constitution, sort of his concluding uh, volume of this period. So he was going to talk about the, you know, the economy in the 1780s under the relatively decentralized Articles of Confederation. And then he would go through the Constitutional Convention and then the ratifying process of the Constitution, as well as the ratifying process of the Bill of Rights. So Rothbard considered the American Revolution to sort of be this, uh, you know, this radical movement. It was sort of libertarian, uh, and it was this, it was this large impulse. It was sort of, you know, one of the you could say the he said, you know, the just wars, the Constitution. Though sometimes it's very revered by libertarians. Rothbard had a very different interpretation. He said it was sort of a conservative counter-revolution, as he said, or actually it was the Articles of Dece Confederation, excuse me, they were too decentralized. Uh, there was basically, uh, in a sense, he said a, a coup to have by the nationalist forces, so guys like James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, uh, et cetera, uh, who wanted to install a stronger government that would allow for uniform tariffs, uh, would allow for essential taxing power to assume the public debt uh, occurred after the civil, uh, excuse, excuse me, incurred after the uh, Revolutionary War, et cetera. So this is a period that, you know, not a lot of people talk about when you read in your text, in your American history textbooks, they kind of say, all right, you had the American Revolution and then the 1780s and there were some kind of problems. So then, although, yeah, here we are, we're at the Constitution, 1789, George Washington's elected president, and then here we go. Uh, Rothbard sort of says, well, well, hold on, we have to analyze how we actually got there. And it's a really fascinating uh, uh, analysis of the era. He wrote it in the 1960s. He was originally commissioned to write a multi-volume history on a multi-volume American uh, history uh, work from a libertarian perspective. So I guess in classic Rothbard fashion, he wrote this massive book on economics. And then, in, you know, that was in the 50s and in the 60s, you know, he's going to kind of switch gears a little bit. And it was originally supposed to be three volumes. Uh, covering basically all of American history up to the night up to 1960, roughly. And what happened is that as Rothbard has a knack to do, his projects get larger and larger. So instead, he had enough material for five volumes just for the first volume. And so what happened was he would handwrite the volumes and then he would dictate them onto a recording machine. And as time went on, he first wanted to get the first four volumes out. He wanted to publish them, and the recording machine basically got. Uh, more and more outdated until in the end it was sort of broken by say 1980 and um, he just had a massive stack of, of uh, this handwritten volume of about 500 pages of actually handwriting things with block quotes with citations and everything so I don't even know his hand must have just been burning at that point um, I, don't, I don't know how he did it and the problem is and if you, don't take my word for it please either look at his books and read his marginalia or go upstairs, his handwriting is very, very hard to read. Okay, it's, it's uh, I almost felt as though I was dealing with one of the founding fathers and the way they would write the cursive, you know, very flowing and all this stuff. And you look at the pages, I almost felt this was the Declaration of Independence. But um, it, so over the summer, I was able to basically uh, decipher uh, Rothbard's handwriting. And a lot of people say sometimes that, oh, you know, you hear about textual exegesis. Like, what do the words mean? Well, I was actually doing a literal text of exegesis. Like, what are the words? Like, not like, what do they mean? But what, what are the words? What, what did he write? And um, so the, I was able to basically work on that over the, over the summer. And um, uh, my goal is I, I would like to uh, have the book, the fourth volume of Conceived in Liberty was published in 1979, so the American Revolution. And I think it would be really great to have the fifth volume come out in 2019. It was only about a 40-year delay, but you know, it was roughly 40-year anniversary, you know, somewhere around then. I think it would be really good. Uh, it's, a great, it's a great analysis of a period that doesn't get a whole lot of um, 
uh, you know, just sort of uh, discussion. And I think it really has a great example. The Constitution was not a voluntary social contract. This is something Rothbard tries to get through. Uh, Rothbard has this theory the states are coercive. There's a conquest theory of the state, and we're all familiar with that. And uh, he really tries to go through the Constitution was a coup. Uh, it wasn't sort of a fair election. The majority of the people did not support it. Uh, the Federalists used an enormous amount of propaganda. They had control of all the newspapers. They had control of Google and Facebook and, and Twitter. And uh, Sorry, that's another thing. I apologize. Uh, this is a different time period. But anyway, uh, I'd love to talk more about it. I'll be sort of mentioning more of my work at the Rothbard Archives in my later talk. I'll be happy to talk about it after. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you, Patrick. I did see some of the manuscript pages, and it really is difficult to understand what Murray was saying until you look at Patrick's text, and it, it uh, reads fairly smoothly. <laughs> Our next speaker, um, Connor Boyek, is the author of the Tuttle Twin series, and I've always been an advocate of uh, educating and re-educating people at a very young age, the youngest age possible, and uh, Connor has done a great service for Liberty uh, with his series on the Tuttle Twins, and he's here to speak to us today about his latest of the Tuttle Twins and the fate of the future. Connor? Thank you. Um, just so I know who I'm speaking to in the audience here, um, who here has, has uh, no shame or anything, who has not yet heard of the Tuttle Twins uh, books? Maybe there, we got like two. All right, I got a little bit of work to do if the Mises faithful don't yet know about these books. So by way of brief introduction. Um, so my name is Connor Boyack. I run a libertarian think tank in Utah called the Libertas Institute. And we're more of a do tank. We change hearts, minds, and laws. Um, and so we've changed a number of laws on a wide range of issues. And I'm a father of two young children. And uh, four years ago, um, I found myself wanting to help my children understand what dad does all day when he's typing on his computer and when he's lobbying up at the Capitol. And uh, so like anyone in my position, I went on Amazon and I Googled, you know, libertarian kids books. And uh, sadly, there were no results. Uh, there was a little stuff about the Constitution. Uh, there was some uh, random coloring books, uh, but there was really nothing to serve this market for children. Uh, to help them understand the ideas of a free society. So I spent about a week being bummed, and then I realized, you dolt, you talk about entrepreneurship all the time and filling market voids, why not actually do that? So uh, I teamed up with a friend of mine who's an illustrator, and uh, we've been going gangbusters ever since. I, I should mention, actually, uh, it was at Freedom Fest in Vegas, I believe, four years ago, where we uh, published the first book. So this is uh, The Tuttle Twins Learn About the Law, and this is based on The Law by Frederick Bastiat. So the whole concept of our books is that each book is based on a classic text or essay. Uh, we take the key ideas from that work, and we wrap it in a fun story, and then it's uh, fully illustrated, uh, about 60 pages long, so that kids can uh, really, just through kind of a fun experience, be exposed to these ideas. So uh, for us, the, this was a bit of a market test. We wanted to see, like, would, would other people be interested in this? And the response was overwhelmingly positive. It was, it was really fun and awesome, and so we decided to keep it going. So I'm going to briefly walk you through uh, each of the books in our series. Uh, these are all, I think, available uh, here in the bookstore. If you want to get them signed for a, a child, a grandchild, or for one or two of you, a great-grandchild, um, I'd be happy to do that uh, while we're here. Um, so be sure and pick them up. And then, of course, I'll talk about the book that we have coming out in a few weeks, which is based on uh, one of Rothbard's books uh, that I'll tell you about in a moment. So uh, for us, the idea here was that there, I mean, look around you on these walls. There's so many books, there's so many works, so many classics uh, uh, that we could draw from. Um, and what we found, actually, I should mention momentarily, I, I had a moment to sp uh, speak with Dr. Paul last night, and he said, you know, on the campaign, he found it so interesting that uh, young people would gravitate to these ideas, and then they would teach their parents. Um, and <laughs> what we found, uh, and I'll tell you, literally multiple times a week, I get emails from parents saying, yeah, I bought your books because so-and-so in my homeschool group or at my church group or whatever said that they teach kids, you know, important values. But these are not Rothbardians. These are not, you know, uh, any... These 
these parents are not part of our movement. They've not heard of these ideas before. They just heard that these are good books for kids to teach them values they don't learn in schools. And, and this happens, I, I would say, easily 75% of our audience are not the, the faithful among us who are trying to transmit the ideas to the next generation. What happens then, is that, as Dr. Paul said, these ideas percolate up. All these emails we get from parents say, yeah, my, my kid asked me why taxation is theft, you know, or why... <laughs> You know, or, <laughs> or we have, I'll, I'll share in a moment, but you know, creature from Jekyll Island, like what, what's this Federal Reserve stuff my four-year-old keeps talking about? <laughs> and so it's fun, it puts pressure on the parents to be like, what, what, are, what is this, right? And, and uh, in fact, just uh, three days ago, I got an email from a 64-year-old woman, and we have a little marketing thing where every time someone gets the books, they get a little text or an email saying, hey, thanks for getting the books, hope you enjoy. And she said, oh no, these aren't for my grandkids, I actually got them for me. Um, and, uh, and that's quite common. So let me take you uh, quickly through the books because we're, we're low on time. Uh, so the next one we did is I Pencil by Leonard Reed. So the Tuttle Twins and the Miraculous Pencil, and this is how the pencil is made and how people throughout the world work together harmoniously despite religion, race, culture, etc. Of course, we have The Creature from Jekyll Island, all about the Fed, uh, inflation, monetary policy, gold. We even have Bitcoin in here. Uh, we even have, uh, I think, Euro-Pacific. Uh, Peter Schiff has one of his you know, little call-outs there. So... Um, the, the <laughs> our age range is about 5 to 11, and uh, what we actually find is the three or four-year-olds will kind of go along because they're fun stories, and maybe if uh, they don't get it, we get a lot of teenagers where this is beneath them a little bit, but the ideas are fresh and intoxicating, and so they'll maybe make an excuse like, yeah, I'll read to my younger uh, kid or younger uh, sibling, uh, but really they're, they're uh, interested by the ideas as well. Uh, the Tuttle Twins and the Food Truck Fiasco. This is based on Economics in One Lesson by Hazlitt. Uh, a lot in here about protectionism and so forth. Uh, tangentially, what was really funny is this story is all about how food trucks are being overregulated, and uh, the, the uh, restaurant owner teams up with the mayor, and they're trying to control the economy and shut these guys out. And in Utah, just a few months after we published this, that literally happened. And in this story, the Tuttle Twins try and you know, uh, overturn the law, create a lot of public support for food trucks, and go and, and you know, kick the protectionist out of town. And that's basically what happened just a few months later. So this was a bit of like weird foreshadowing that we... Um, <laughs> We actually passed in Utah the, the nation's first food truck freedom uh, law, so we, uh, maybe I should write more books that will then uh, turn into to positive reforms. Uh, the Tuttle Twins on the Road to Serfdom, uh, except our serfdom is a U, not an E, and so it's a town serfdom where uh, the city uses eminent domain to steal a bunch of land and through central planning try and create a beach destination resort community called serfdom. Um, and so the... Um, <laughs> If, uh, if you know Ben Swan at all, he makes an appearance in here, so uh, that was a lot of fun. There's so many Easter eggs in here, and, and really, it's only the people in this crowd that would probably be able to identify a lot of these Easter eggs. For example, if you go to uh, the Tuttle Twins Learn About the Law, I would invite you to go open a copy uh, in the bookstore, and I think it's on page 13. They go into the neighbor's house, who's named Fred, after Frederick Bastiat, and he has to, uh, you can't see it, but he has to go fetch a book from his bookshelf, and if you read closely uh, and you see all these titles on the bookshelf, uh, you will see a lot of commonalities with the, the, the bookshelves here. Uh, the Tuttle Twins and the Golden Rule. So this is based on a foreign policy of freedom by Dr. Paul, all about the non-aggression principle uh, applied to uh, interpersonal relationships for kids to be able to understand why the Golden Rule is actually uh, uh, quite related to some of the broader uh, uh, non-aggression principle and other axioms that we believe in. Uh, Ayn Rand makes an appearance, uh, the Tuttle Twins and the Search for Atlas. So this is basically Atlas Shrug for kids. Yes, we pulled it off. No, there's no objectivism in here. Uh, so we had to draw a line, and there's no sex, uh, you know, either. <laughs> we, we have to dance around these things. Um, finally, a few months ago, we, uh, our most recent title is The Tuttle Twins and the Spectacular Show Business. This is based on competition and entrepreneurship by Dr. Kirstner, and basically it's a fun way for us to expose kids to free market ideas through entrepreneurship, which is a really hot topic right now. Um, okay, low on time, so briefly, the next book that we have in a few months, and if this is of interest to you, the Mises Institute is going to have uh, plenty of copies here soon, so talk to Jeff or a member of his staff if you want to reserve your copy. It's going to be called uh, The Tuttle Twins and the Fate of the Future, and it's Anatomy of the State by Rothbard. So yes, we will soon have a ton of anarcho-capitalist six-year-olds running around. Um, 
We, we've been accused of propagandizing little children, to which I say I plead guilty. So uh, they've been propagandized in other ways for far too long. Um, the whole concept for us, though, is to help children understand the key contrast between persuasion and coercion, between society and the state. And briefly, the way the story plays out is uh, they have a, a monthly a summer book club with them and their friends. And so each month they do a different topic. It's their turn to pick the topic. They go over to Fred's house and his amazing bookshelf. And lo and behold, they find a copy of Anatomy of the State. And, uh, and they had just the night before watched a dystopian movie. So they're really worried about the future and oppressive government and the scary story. And, uh, and at the end of every book club, after they talk about the ideas, they do an activity. And so in this book, the activity is going to be all of the kids with the Legos get to try and build a future that they envision. And while the other kids who are all growing up in statist families are creating centralized, you know, Lego systems of what the, the world should be like in the future, uh, I'm not going to spoil it right now, but at the end of the story, uh, they use a bit of Legos to creatively come up with uh, a future without the state and what that might look like. Um, I'll briefly mention, just as I close here, uh, so we've sold about a quarter million copies of these books now. They're, they're doing really well. Thank you. Um, and I should mention that this was never a mastermind project. As I said, we kind of stumbled into this, and this is a side project for me. You know, my, my think tank stuff uh, is, is uh, what I spend most of my time on. Uh, but there's clearly a need for this, and it's only grown, and, um, and, and it's been tremendously humbling to see the response we get from families who can now actually communicate to their children about these ideas rather than waiting until they're college students or adults to, to talk about these ideas. It's a very effective way to introduce a lot of the concepts that we believe in, so I hope they're useful to you. Please pick up some copies if you don't already have them. Um, last year, we decided that this wasn't enough. So yes, it's great that we're selling a lot, but uh, there are so many people out there who need to hear these ideas, so many children who need to be exposed to these concepts and at least uh, be made aware of them. So last year, we formed a new nonprofit called the Association for Teaching Kids Economics. Uh, we've partnered up with FEE, where they're at kind of a high school college age now. We're working in the K through 8 space. And so we're taking these books, we're building lesson plans around them, um, and then we're getting them into the schools. Last year, we reached about 20,000 students uh, through this different philanthropic model of, of getting directly to the classroom, and it's been a tremendous success as a pilot test. So if that is of uh, interest to you in trying to, to educate kids at all uh, with these ideas, I'd love to talk to you this weekend. I'll be here until tomorrow midday. Very grateful for everything the Mises Institute is doing. They've been tremendous supporters of the book series. Uh, if you're not aware of them, I would encourage you to please go pick up some copies. And in a few weeks, stay tuned, and we'll have uh, Rothbard coming out for kids as well. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. OK, our next uh, presenter is Dr. David Gordon. He's a senior fellow with the Mises Institute. And he's going to talk to us t this morning, giving us a preview of a forthcoming uh, work book by the Institute called Rothbard A to Z. David? Oh, uh, thank you. I'm very glad to be here at the uh, Mises Institute. But I do feel I'm. On this panel, I'm here under false pretenses in that uh, not only am I not the author of Rothbard A to Z, the book consists of quotations from Murray Rothbard, but I'm not even the editor of the book. I, I have the only connection I have with the book is that I was asked to do an introduction to it, uh, perhaps because uh, Rothbard is the scholar who's influenced me the most in all matters, political and economic, and uh, I knew him quite well over many years. Uh, what the book uh, Rothbard A to Z consists of, as you will surmise, is a collection of quotations from Murray Rothbard. And the book was sent to the Mises Institute by Edward Fuller. I don't know Mr. Fuller, but he had the idea entirely on his own to do a compilation of quotations from Rothbard, and he simply sent this in to the Institute. Uh, there are two ways that one might attempt such a project, and uh, Mr. Fuller has selected the more difficult of these two ways. One way would be 
simply to go through Rothbard's works and select particular quotations that were especially sparkling or significant. But what Mr. Fuller has done, he's certainly done that, but he's gone beyond that. He's done a very comprehensive work. The manuscript is over 800 pages, and he's given Rothbard's views on really any topic you might be interested in. If, uh, say, if you wanted to find, uh, he has Alvin Hansen leading American Keynesian, anyone you would think even very obscure topics. If you want to know what Rothbard thought about the topic, you'll find it in this book. So what I'd like to do is just give you a few quotations from the book that will uh, give you some idea of what the book is like. Uh, as you know, uh, Murray Rothbard was a scholar of many different disciplines he ranged perhaps more widely than nearly any other scholar over many fields, but he's uh, best known as an economist and economic historian. That was his specialty. And as you will uh, no doubt be aware, one of his main targets was the Keynesian economics. So I just give you a couple of comments he made on Keynes. He says, uh, Keynesianism, Keynesianism has become the pure economics of power. So you see here how he can summarize just a few words, the essence of Keynesianism. And as you will know, in the Keynesian system, a great deal of stress is placed on aggregate spending as really the driver or mover of the economy. And in the Austrian view, this is the uh, not correct that the spending level is really the result of forces in the economic system rather than the cause of what's happening. And uh, Murray sums up this in a characteristic way. He says, uh, the, uh, uh, the Keynesians have the entire causal process bollocked up. <laughs> now, uh, Rothbard was, of course, not only just an economist or confined to economics, but he was a political thinker and uh, one of the, the really the founder of the uh, anarcho-capitalism. And he has some characteristic comments here that I'd like to share with you. Uh, one of them, which I think is. Uh, really perhaps sums up his thought better than any other. He says, uh, the use of coercion is the legislation of immorality. And this really reflects his whole way of thinking that, the, uh, in his view, the liberty is the highest political value and the use of coercion is what's... Uh, to be opposed at all costs. And he says uh, against those who talk about, say, well, we, even if coercion is bad, we at least have to have government. We can't exist without a government preserving law and order. So although the free market is a good thing as a whole, we need a government to uh, preserve order. Uh, he says, uh, Government is no more necessary for providing vital protection services than it is necessary for providing anything else. So he rejects entirely the dichotomy that's found in uh, some supporters of the free market who say we have to make an exception for government. It's for, for Rothbard, it's the free market all the way. And in fact, this is how he became someone who was who became an anarchist in around 1949 or so, uh, 48, 49, uh, when, he, when he was at uh, Columbia University as a graduate student. One of the objections raised his free market position was, well, 
of course, uh, if you're right, why wouldn't we you favor free market in, in government and in protection services? Everybody would think that was nonsense. That was a reductio ad absurdum argument directed against Rothbard. And he thought about that and he thought, well, this argument is actually right. <laughs> why, should, why do we need a government? And he was thinking about that that really converted him to a free market anarchist position. Uh, and uh, he says in connection with uh, government intervening in the economy, he says interventionism is not only immoral and aggressive, it doesn't work. So he's against all types of interventionism. And he said, make all markets free and legal. Uh, now, when we talk about uh, non-intervention or having no government or having uh, freeing all markets, one of the crucial uh, dimensions of government policy is foreign policy. And this is an area which uh, Ron Paul has been especially concerned with in his career in Congress. And Rothbard says about foreign policy, he says, uh, libertarians are opposed to mass murder and so believe in a peaceful foreign policy. This, I think, really sums up what the essence of thought of foreign policy is simply, we don't want uh, intervention because this leads to war and massacres and uh, we want to avoid that. It seems a very simple statement, but it really solves, it really strikes at the essence of the matter. Uh, uh, as you will know, there's been a controversy in uh, much in recent libertarianism between so-called left and right libertarians and there have been various discussions of what sort of social values, if any, libertarians are committed to. And Rothbard, although he certainly didn't make uh, this part of his definition of libertarianism, was himself someone who, fa who had quite uh, conservative social values uh, and free, he was opposed to the uh, contemporary uh, leftist measures that really uh, try to regulate all manner of thought and action. And he says, for example, uh, I am no fan of affirmative action in any sense. And the last quotation I'll give you really... Uh, to my mind, reflects his own marriage to Joey Rothbard, whom I knew very well. It was They were a very loving couple. They really, uh, they really were a great team. Uh, Murray called her the indispensable framework. And he says, uh, I am foursquare for the closed marriage the marriage in which two partners live in trust and fidelity. And that was certainly true of his own marriage to Joey. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, when this book comes out uh, and I'll be, I'm very uh, pleased I was able to talk to you about the book, even though it's one I have no real uh, connection with. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, you might be wondering what in the world is a book of quotes useful for? It, what is the Institute doing publishing something that otherwise is a coffee table book? Well, I can tell you, um, I'm the editor of the Quotable Mises, and that's been out for many years now, so I have a lot of experience, a lot of feedback as to exactly how uh, the book is used. 
Um, the first use uh, that I came to know and have seen many examples of it is students use the quotable Mises to research a particular topic. They'll go to a particular section. They'll read the quotes that we've given uh, amongst many possible other quotes. And then they'll see the references. They'll go online to our website and get a PDF copy of the book and then read that section uh, as part of their research paper, usually, usually college paper. Um, academics use it in a very similar way. Uh, they're writing a paper on a particular subject and they get to a point where they want to uh, have a quotation uh, from Mises, in, in my case, or in Rothbard, uh, in Ed's case, um, and uh, go and get that quote, look it up, uh, on our web page, the context that the quote is made in, uh, and then use it in their own uh, research. Of course, uh, ordinary, ed everyday citizens, educators uh, use the book. Um, the media uses the book. Uh, when they want to quote uh, Ludwig von Mises, uh, the quotable Mises is a very handy source uh, for them to go to so they don't have to actually make uh, contact with the Institute and our scholars and so forth. Um, they have an easy access. Uh, and then there's the more diabolical use, which I've come to know, uh, that many of you might have engaged in, where you buy the quote, the, the quotable Mises, uh, and then you surreptitiously uh, put them in your uh, uh, condo rentals at the beach and uh, waiting rooms at the office, uh, just hoping to lure somebody in <laughs> to reading a couple of quotes of Ludwig von Mises. And they are startling enough uh, that people really uh, t pay attention to, to what they see. So it's a, a very valuable project. It af affects people at all levels. And uh, I encourage you to support that effort. Now, um, my own book is The Skyscraper Curse. Uh, it's just recently been published by the Mises Institute, um, and I'm very grateful, uh, first of all, to Jeff Deist. It was his idea in the first place, and I think a most excellent one and most timely one. Uh, several of you in the room have uh, financially supported the publication uh, of the book, so I, I want to thank you uh, as well. Uh, many of the scholars, uh, including David and Patrick and others, uh, have read earlier copies uh, of the manuscript, so I want to thank you. And Floyd was uh, extremely helpful. Uh, Judy Thomason, uh, magnificent as usual. Um, and, uh, and so a lot of people uh, deserve a lot of credit uh, for bringing this book to fore um, at this critical time that was discussed by David Stockman uh, yesterday. Finally, uh, Roger Garrison is in the audience. He was a professor of mine in graduate school. And in a, in a very unlikely meeting, uh, I think in the summer of 1981, uh, Roger and I met at a conference, and he's the one that introduced the concept of the Austrian business cycle theory uh, to me. So I just want to lay all the blame there back on Roger. <laughs> um, so what is the skyscraper curse? Well, it's the unlikely correlation between the building of the world's tallest skyscraper and an ensuing economic crisis. So it's really the, the skyscraper index, which was first put forth by Andrew Lawrence, a real estate analyst, um, in 1999, uh, that I picked up on. It was published in all the financial press, Investors Business Daily, Business Week, Forbes, Fortune, East Asian Review. Um, so it caught a lot of people's attention, uh, but it quickly faded from the scene. Nobody really thought much of it. It was probably like other stock market indexes that come and go, that uh, succeed and then fail. Um, but the skyscraper curse uh, has remained strong. Uh, and let me point out to you that it's not the building of the skyscraper that causes the collapse, okay? <laughs> Um, now, you might think that point is obvious, but not obvious enough to three economists at uh, Rutgers University who wrote a paper saying, 
skyscraper building does not cause economic crises. <laughs> and they had all this fancy, they had all this fancy econometrics and elaborate data sources uh, to, to say that the uh, skyscraper curse was a farce and uh, that I was making the whole thing up, etc. And then, uh, maybe the pinnacle of my career, the Economist magazine reported in a lengthy editorial about that article saying that the skyscraper curse was just a fluke and that skyscraper building does not cause economic crises. Well, if they had bothered to read the original paper, uh, which The Economist did cite, uh, they didn't mention my name and they got the date wrong, but they did cite it. <laughs> but it's fairly obvious that what I say in the paper is that monetary policy at the Federal Reserve, keeping interest rates too low for too long, causes a lot of bad investments, a lot of speculative behavior, and so on that is affiliated with the boom. And at the pinnacle of these major swings, you see the building of the world's tallest building. And uh, that gives several examples of that. Uh, this, um, the World uh, Trade Center in, in uh, the early 70s, going back to the Great Depression when you saw the Chrysler Building and the Empire State Building, uh, the record is fairly clear, um, and I thought the paper was fairly clear. I certainly make it a lot clearer um, in the book, and as a matter of fact, in the introduction, I bring the reader's attention immediately to these economists at Rutgers University <laughs> and the Economist magazine, and then I go to proceed to show uh, what the original paper uh, said, which is that the Federal Reserve is causing the boom-bust cycle and these buildings of the world record skyscrapers. So um, I want to thank everybody that was involved in the project and who supported the project. Uh, I'm very grateful, and we're very happy that the book has been able to come out uh, at this critical time. Thank you.